Uh, thanks for coming. And I want to say thanks to Politics and Prose for letting me be here today. This is, you're sitting or standing in the best bookshop in Washington, D.C. right now. And, and if you've never been here before, check it out. There's a great kids' book section downstairs and a great cafe. It's a wonderful, wonderful bookstore. And if you have been here before, remember to come back <laughs> and tell your friends. This is a fantastic store. And uh, I want to thank you all for being here today. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to see you all here. So uh, yeah, this book. I'm going to answer one of the questions that someone's going to ask me just to start out with. A lot of people ask me, how long did it take you to write this book? And I can answer that by telling you that the germ of the idea for this happened to me in a restaurant in 1980. But I didn't start writing the book till 1994, and it took me two years to do the first draft, and it's gone through about eight revisions. So you tell me <laughs> how long it takes to write a book. Now, um, I could start at the beginning of this book. I'm going to read a little bit from it. And I could start at the beginning, but that would make things a little too easy for all of us. So I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to start on page 27. But I'll tell you a little bit about what this is. Willis Gidney is a private eye who works in Washington, D.C. He also grew up without parents or a home in Washington, D.C. So when his best friend asks him to find a daughter who's been missing for 25 years, a detective is compelled to help him, even though it's kind of an impossible case. They don't know the daughter's name. They don't know where she's living. They don't know her birth date. But he agrees to take this case to help his friend. Now, what the part I'm going to read you is he's begun his investigation, and he's on Capitol Hill. Inside the Rayburn House office building, I stepped through the metal detector, then watched my phone glide across the grainy black and white TV screen, a fuzzy gray shape on a grayer background. It reminded me of the first time I'd ever seen a security monitor. I was a kid inside a Metro Rail Guards kiosk. I don't have what you'd call a linear memory of childhood. Tiny pieces like flecks of light filtered through tree leaves, shifting winking on and off, so jumbled I couldn't tell you what was real and what I dreamed. Fragments of images, ghost sensations. I see myself in a baby's crib under a porch light at night. A woman, my mother, walks past me into the house. Why am I outside? Why doesn't she pick me up, take me in with her? Did it really happen? I have sense memories of a woman holding me, a dog barking, the smell of sulfur and snow falling. Another jump cut and I'm older on the streets of Washington, looking at the U.S. Capitol simmer in the heat and thinking it was a merry-go-round. As a kid, each day I spent on the street, I figured I was stealing, getting away with something. I had no way to see what I was losing. You live on the street, the first thing you lose is your identity. If you're young, this happens fast. There's lots of reasons why. Number one is the people around you, men and women and boys and girls who've passed through society like phantoms through an alien dimension existing only as stranger's peripheral vision. Filler for the paper's metro section. These folks are your peers, your friends, the village that's raising you, except it's not a village. It's a pack. So you do what they do. This time I'm telling you about, when I got busted, wasn't the worst of it. Not by a long shot. It's just the first time I got caught. And God is definitely part of my first true linear memory. He has some scam using a Xerox machine and a $5 bill slipping the copies into the fare card machines of the Metro. He knew the bill readers and those machines couldn't tell a copy from the real thing. God, a 10-year-old black kid whose full name was Godfrey White, had been my mentor for a month. I had bunked with him beneath the Whitehurst Freeway in a cardboard box that had once held a GE refrigerator. Two-door self-defrosting, ice maker included. <laughs> with God's help, I knew I could stay out of Junior Village and Bachman's. I'd never been to either, but my mental image was if they caught me, I'd be chained to the wall and gnawed on by rats. Later, I found I wasn't far off the mark. Getting me into the Metro Guard's kiosk had been part of God's grand plan. I paid attention while he explained how he would feed the Xerox copies of his $5 bill into the Metro fare card machines. The amount $5 would light up. Then God would tab the minus button until the fare showed five cents. Tab another button, and down the chute would tumble $4.95 and change. Not a bad return on a 10-cent Xerox. The only trouble with God's fare car scam 
was that the bottom of the coin return was metal. All that change tumbling down made a racket. The Metro guard who sat in a nearby glassed-in booth might begin to suspect something, particularly if you heard that sound 10 times in a row. Gott figured that 4950 was all the change he could manage to carry away in his paper sack. My job, distract the guard. How? I asked. Cry and tell him you're lost, God said. I was a despicable little brat and took to my role with gusto. I played the lost little boy with an intensity that would have expelled me from the most amateur play. I was too young to know better. I thought I was great. I cried, Mommy, Daddy, Mommy, Daddy, as I approached the Metro guard, and he recoiled exquisitely. I was incoherent with fear and pain in hopes he would open the door to the booth and I could get inside. He didn't want to leave his booth. He tried speaking to me through his little microphone. I wasn't having that. I cried harder. My pale little face beat red, the tears streaming down. Real tears. I was playing an abandoned kid, method acting. I beat my fists against the window to block out the sound of the change gushing down the chute. God told me I'd get half the take, and that was all the motivation I needed. Finally, the guard, a kindly-looking white guy with a salt-and-pepper goatee, opened the door. I practically fell inside. I hugged his knees and cried, my voice bouncing off the glass walls of the booth. So far, God had used four of his copies. What's the matter, boy? The guard asked. I wailed even louder, my ear-splitting voice reverberating off the glass walls. It was even giving me a headache. Did you lose your mommy and daddy? My mouth opened. I screamed and nodded. Outside, a nearby steady stream of change clanked. Where'd you lose them? I heard another crash of coins. That would be eight. And took a breath. The guard thought he was calming me, but I was building towards my big finish. In heartrending sobs, I said that the subway doors had closed behind my parents and the train had pulled away without me. Which way was the train going? I'll call ahead, the guard said. Not here, I sobbed. D -d Downtown. The stutter was a nice touch. <laughs> Meanwhile, God had finished and hefting his swag, staggered towards the exit. I held up my hands to the guard. I said, I was all right now. I'd find my folks. Don't worry. I figured he'd be glad to get rid of me. I was wrong. He started to come after me, his hand out, a solicitous expression on his face. I backed away, realizing I may have overplayed my part just a <laughs> tiny bit. I retreated into something and fell, and there was a crash, and God's bag of coins hit the tile floor, and coins were bouncing off the floor like water drops on a red-hot skillet. The last time I saw God, he was hot-footing it out of there as a Metro guard grabbed my arm, his fingers tight. I can still feel his fingers there. <laughs>